In just the past month, President Trump has pardoned two people who did prison time for financial crimes. But he's taking the most heat for granting a full pardon to a former Army lieutenant named Michael Bahanna, who killed, served five years for killing an Iraqi man while he was in American custody. Our next guest wrote a piece in The Washington Post that's critical of the president for pardoning a war criminal. He's also a combat veteran who served in Iraq, and he's the author of Marching into Darkness, the Wehrmacht and the Holocaust in Belarus. Rich spoke with Waitman Bourne earlier this week. Waitman, I want to read a line from a piece you wrote in the Washington Post recently in an editorial. You said, when Trump champions war criminals as brave patriots or simply victims of political correctness, he seems to push for a climate that condones unethical and criminal behavior. You argued that this is dangerous. I think one of the, way, one of the reasons that it's so dangerous is uh, because we... Um, retain the, the right to prosecute our own uh, military members for crimes they commit while abroad. And if we go around pardoning criminals, it sends a message to our partner, our host countries, that their citizens will not be protected by our law, uh, which could put our own soldiers in danger, both from local population, uh, from the governments themselves who may not be as interested in supporting them, um, and things like that. It's just a, it's a bad precedent to set. You know, we talked about some of the examples I said um, where there's really some egregious behavior that even the courts found um, um, without exception. And in each of those circumstances, the president either mitigated or uh, claimed there's political correctness involved. Part of it to me, Waitman, I don't know how you feel about it is, the president avoided military service, but you would never hear those things, for example, from the late John McCain, a person who not only served the POW himself, that you don't mitigate things like war crimes or torturing prisoners, et cetera, especially if you put on a uniform in your past. Uh, do you think there's merit to that? Absolutely. I mean, I think that, and in fact, I've heard from a lot of uh, my friends who are still serving um, on all ends of the political spectrum uh, that they agreed with, uh, with the sentiments I expressed. One of the really interesting things uh, that came out of the article, you know, they say never read the comments, but a lot of the comments are from Vietnam veterans who are um, reinforcing my point that I'm making and, and, and thanked me for writing it. There are situations in war and combat where things are fluid, they're uncertain, they're unclear, you're making split-second decisions, um, and those are times um, when we can stray into that gray area of whether or not um, a civilian um, who may have been hurt or killed was sort of an accident or uh, happened in the fog of war. Um, and, and those are areas that we can debate back and forth. But I think what you pointed out and what I pointed out is that with these three individuals, it's just cold-blooded murder. I mean, there is no fog of war going on here. This is just calculated you know, in one case, walking someone out into a field and shooting them. In the Behenna case, you have him, you know, intentionally stripping the man naked, abusing him, and then shooting him in the head and the chest. You know, and I would just point out that at every stage in that process, there's a moment to stop and think and, and not do that, um, unlike, you know, in the middle of a, of a firefight or something like that. So I think that certainly those are pretty clear-cut cases, which makes it even more egregious for the president to to try to minimize them. And I do agree that for most servicemen and women, you know, it gives us all a bad name to a certain extent if, if that kind of behavior is held up as what is normal or okay. You began your uh, a piece by saying, uh, taking us back to 2003, um, right before uh, your troops were getting ready uh, to deploy to Iraq, and you took the time, as other officers did as well, to explain about not only what you were likely to find, but also about the law of war. And there are laws of war, certainly, that if we're going to hold ourselves up to, that we adhere to. Um, but you say there's a historical precedence to that, that bad leaders will be, get bad results and murderous leaders will have murderous units. And you wrote a book talking about um, Germany in the times of Hitler and in 1941 and some of the directives. And you could almost predict um, the type of leadership on the ground the troops would have um, and the treatment that they would give to 
um, whether it was prisoners or whether um, it would be people that they encountered. Uh, explain a little bit more about that and, and take us back to the German example. And you take great pains to say you're not in any way connoting where we are right now in 2019 in the U.S. to Nazi Germany. But nonetheless, there was a historical almost marker that kind of serves to argument to really bolster your argument. My, my question, my historical question in that book was, you know, how did the German army get involved literally in the Holocaust, in, in murdering Jews and murdering other civilians, uh, when that's, that's not the job of military? And even in the Nazi state in the, in the beginning, you know, that's the job of the SS to, to carry out sort of the systematic murder. And yet, how does the, the German army, an institution with a, a long history of, of a certain kind of honor, um, get involved in this? And what I found uh, via five case studies uh, that happened to take place in the same region at the same time is that there was an organizational culture, or we, we would call it a command climate, that um, not only condoned but encouraged what we would consider to be illegal behavior and what was, in fact, illegal behavior even at the time, um, according to the, the treaties that Germany itself had signed. So one of the most egregious examples, there was a, what's called now the jurisdiction order, in which Hitler essentially said, look, for crimes that, that would be crimes elsewhere in Europe that you would be prosecuted for, that, that prosecution is not mandatory in the war in the Soviet Union. Uh, because according to Nazi ideology, uh, the Soviets were, um, you know, subhuman. They were Slavic people. Um, they didn't deserve the same considerations um, as others. And Jews, of course, are included in that. And one of the points that I that I take pains to make is that this message, though it originates at the absolute highest level, um, finds itself expressed at the lowest level on the ground, which is what I was particularly interested in. Um, you know, how does an individual soldier participate? What does, what does complicity look like? And what I found was, in most cases, um, you had units that were sort of prepared, uh, given the, the opportunity to participate in, in war crimes. Conversely, as I mentioned in the, in the piece, um, there were a few units where leaders were, uh, made it clear that they were opposed to this kind of behavior, and that kind of behavior did not take place. It's, it's fascinating. The more you, uh, for our viewers, if you get a chance to read this, uh, and again, the book, Marching into Darkness, uh, but also as it applies to now, that this idea that your PC, if you follow the rules of law uh, uh, the, as it relates to war, is short-sighted, um, especially as we talk now with Iran, et cetera, if we're ever going to put our guys back in harm's way. Um, not everybody uh, follows the same rules, but if you don't, you can certainly expect to see uh, worse treatment on the other end. Uh, Waitman, I appreciate a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Up next, roadblocks in the push to legalize recreational marijuana in New York and New Jersey. We've got the latest next.